So good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you. Obviously, um, we're delighted to be talking today, all things would you believe mould. Um, and um, I wish that I actually didn't have to talk mould. Um, I wish that I actually could talk about other fun things. Um, but I met Roger Joyner the other day from Passive House and um, we were talking about, um, you know, this kind of concept. And as some of you might be aware, I've actually uh, called out a few builders uh, where I've had apartment owners actually face mould and it's not a pretty sight and it's not good for your health. And um, so consequently, when I met Roger and we were talking about this subject and what he showed me that he's doing, I thought, well, I think we should do a session about mould. And um, then I made the fatal error of actually spelling mold, M-O-L-D. And I have a number of gra grammar Nazis, obviously on my database who actually then contacted me and said it's M-O-U-L-D. My audio, um, I don't want to audio. <laughs> so I have now changed it for the presentation, everybody. So I hope that you're happy with me for that purpose. Um, but, you know, I was, I did actually double check because when I looked at it with M-O-U-L-D and then I so I Googled it, it came up M-O-L-D. So then I changed it. So, but I have now been corrected. So, um, so welcome to Roger. Thank you for joining us today, Roger. Um, and Roger obviously loves mold and uh, loves ventilation. And we're going to hear all about. Uh, I that haven't got shortly. my sound on. So how do I? Can I get you out and get back on. in? Huh? Yes, you can. How can I get out and get back in? Yeah. Yes, you can. Yes. But how I do I do that? Spelling. All right, my apologies, everybody. All right, so just before we start with Roger's presentation, um, the Australian Apartment Advocacy, we're the voice of 2.5 million people who choose apartments Australia-wide, mm, and of two. course that's only going to actually um, <sighs> increase over time um, as infill becomes um, a, a strike, very strong, popular choice among a number of obviously governments and also apart wall residents as well. And we call it the easy breezy lifestyle, but of course it's very important that um, you have a quality built apartment and hence the topic about mold uh, certainly ties into that as well. Um, we launched an education kit in Victoria in July. I'm delighted to say that we're currently working on the Queensland kit, which we should be launching in the next couple of weeks. And we just secured a grant from the city of Sydney to also create the New South Wales um, uh, kit. So soon we'll be, well, well Australia-wide. Um, someone said to me the other day when I think about going into New Zealand, I don't know about that. I think uh, we'll just stay for Australia for a bit and then we'll think about the other countries as we move forward. So I'm gonna hand across to Roger now as we talk about circumventing mold. Um, and that's basically both um, pre-construction and also post-construction. So Roger, I'll hand over to you. Oh, thanks, Sam, and hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. It's uh, uh, really nice to be able to get and talk to people about mold and, uh, well, rather, the, the effects of uh, humidity and cold surfaces. Uh, it's a conundrum that uh, is, is rife, really, throughout uh, much of our building, um, and it's just simply uh, much to do with, uh, with the way we live now and the way we, uh, where we close our buildings up. So uh, can we have the next slide, please, Sam? Sure. Uh, yeah, look, you would have probably seen this uh, uh, this uh, line a few times now. Um, uh, anybody in the uh, energy efficiency line will talk to you about 90% of our time being spent inside buildings. And uh, it, it really has been uh, uh, driven by people obviously spending time in, the, in, in offices and as well as home. Um, we spend our time inside a conditioned space for more than 90% because we simply we are we travel on the air conditioned transport, the cars air conditioned, the offices and the malls, the shops are all air conditioned. So we've got this, uh, this requirement for a really controlled temperature uh, level that keeps us comfortable. And uh, there's a number of things that that's causing. Um, next slide, please, Sam. So really when we're talking about uh, uh, making our houses feel comfortable, we're talking about uh, temperature. Mostly, we talk about the, the, the warmth uh, in the winter and being cool in the summer. And uh, the, the general solution to this is uh, we certainly don't want drafts, um, but normally in, uh, most uh, housing now is uh, the, the simple installation of a split air conditioning system. Um, so you have a compressor outside and a, 
an evaporator unit with a fan in it inside and the gases are compressed and, uh, and they can provide uh, cooling in the summer. And with the reverse cycle, they produce heating as well in the winter. So, you know, they're really, really good um, and they're economical to install. Next slide, please. So we, we, we do this really well um, the, the, we, um, and we control temperature and to some degree we control uh, humidity in the summer because you know they have a little pipe and that drips water outside. But the real issue here is that they just recirculate the same air inside the room. So the air just continues to go around and around and stays at a reasonable temperature. A little bit of humidity moisture being taken out but not very much. Next slide. And, um, you know, in housing uh, and, uh, and some apartments, larger apartments, you get a ducted system. It does exactly the same sort of thing, collects air up in a big grill, perhaps in the hallway, and then uh, distributes the, uh, the, the air that's been either cooled or heated uh, and pops that into all the other rooms, the, the living area rooms. Um, it still keeps the need for extract from the toilets and uh, indoor toilets and uh, bathrooms and laundries. And... Uh, um, but the air is still just going round and round. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, with it going round and round, oh, sorry, what happens sorry. is it's the same air. We take a, we change the temperature of it, and oh, we take a little oh, bit of moisture yeah. out. I'm to touch base with you. But um, really, what's happening is it's the same air. So as we breathe out carbon dioxide, as we you know, breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide, the level of carbon dioxide increases in the air. Uh, the moisture, you know, the, we sit uh, here in the in, in the summer, and and if I was outside in the winter, you'd see huff coming from me. There's a moisture coming out, and I'm exhaling moisture all the time. And exactly the same things happening in the summer. So we're increasing the uh, the moisture content in the air inside our houses, and we're also in, uh, concentrating volu uh, volatile organic com compounds, VOCs. I'm sure you've all heard of, you know, that new car smell and the the carpet smell and every, all of those new things. Lots of it comes from glues and paints and surface uh, finishes. So all of that, and the longer we keep the, the, the space enclosed, the more and more toxic it becomes. Next slide, please. And of course, in apartments, you know, uh, Roger, we are actually making them very airtight nowadays with design, aren't we? Oh, there's a there's a real and this is why I said use this word conundrum in the title. The 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 the, the, the building code, the National Construction Code, has taken a great deal of interest in in thermal efficiency. And we know it's always been said the cheapest way to um, to to get the house more efficient is to seal up the drafts and and stop the cold air coming in, in the winter. And in Australia, lots of Australia there's hot air in the summer. So. Um, that was that's a, an easy one to uh, to adopt, and that's actually happened. But with this conundrum, there's all sorts of other ramifications. It just becoming understood that there are there are a whole raft of things that need to be taken into account when you start to do this, um, and certainly the. Uh, uh, the, the 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 moisture content is is a really important one, and that's what leads us to mold. Um, and and from a health point of view, it's the fresh air. We all need thirty cubic meters of fresh air every hour. Yeah, it's that simple uh, number of breaths and um, uh, and lung size. So we we need this sort of that amount of fresh air all the time. Um, it takes about ten minutes so open windows every hour to get that amount of fresh air into. And pretty much, um, unless it's you know a nice warm summer day uh, or, or spring or autumn day, you know you're not going to have the windows open for that length of time, cumulative, cumulatively across the uh, the whole day. So at some point, we're just building up toxic toxic conditions in our houses. Next slide. And and uh, the. Uh, uh, lady that I trained with in uh, in New Zealand for Passive House, she ran a, 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 a study uh, there and the only way there that they could keep the CO2 levels down in a double bedroom overnight was to have a sliding sash window, you know, a double hung window with the top and bottom open and run a heater. It was the only way that you could make the, a sufficient natural flow keep the, uh, the 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 co2 levels the carbon dioxide levels in the air and that's how we you know you, you sleep better with, uh, with 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 a cooler environment and with fresh air um once it gets over a thousand parts per million you start to get uh, you start to sleep badly um and at 1400 which is quite common you know you just you just don't get a good night's sleep you're not ready for the next day next slide please 
But the difficulty we have, of course, is that I actually often have people ring me and they say, I've got, you know, mold in my apartment and, you know, I've been told to open my window and it's the middle of winter. So, you know, it kind of... <laughs> It kind of contradicts itself, doesn't it? Really, in a way. Oh, it, it, and it is, and it is, and that's that, and that's where this this uh, um, uh, conundrum comes from. Uh, next click, please. And there we go. Circumventing mold. It's all about venting. Next slide, please. And uh, we need to just uh, appreciate where we're we're talking about here. So uh, humidity is water um, is water in the air. Uh, next click. And water vapor, this is the invisible thing that you see at the end of the kettle spout. If, any, if anybody's ever still using a kettle spout, um, the, the water vapor is invisible, visible. And next click. And the stuff that you can see is actually condensed water, and we call that steam. So even in the summer, there's water vapor in our air. There's lots and lots of it. And the warmer the air is, the more it can hold. Next slide. And when it's in the outdoors and it's in the cold in the winter, we call it mist. Next slide. And air can hold a lot more water when it's warm. So the same conditions here in this slide. Next click, please. That's high humidity. And in a warm day, next click. It's low humidity, but it can be exactly the same amount of moisture in the air. It's just that as the temperature drops, the water can, the air can hold less water and that water condenses out, becomes steam. So as the temperature drops, the, humid, the, the relative humidity gets higher and we get dampness forming. Next slide, please. And there it is. Overnight, as the temperature drops, next click, and then their temperature drops, which due in the morning. There's no difference in the necessarily in the amount of moisture that's in the air. It's just as the temperature drops on the surface of the leaves, then the, the air, the moisture in the air, the humidity will, will condense on those surfaces. Next slide, please. And so you can see here, as the temperature is increasing, the amount of relative humidity is actually getting less and less as the temperature increases. Next slide, please. And this is the result. Uh, this is a nice a modern window in a modern house, sorted to be uh, particularly uh, uh, energy efficient, double glazing, had aluminium frames in it without thermal breaks in. And as you can see, uh, the, 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 the condensation, the humidity is condensed on the frame because that's the coldest part here. Next click. And that reaches 100% uh, relative humidity. Next click. It condenses. And there we are. You can see the results on there. Aluminium uh, transfers heat even better than glass and certainly better than concrete and all those other materials that we have. So the aluminium will be the coldest part. If you go to your window now and you've got aluminium windows and put your hand on the glass, you'll feel something pretty close to the outside. If you've got double glazing, it'll be a bit better. But you go to the aluminium and that will feel much closer to the temperature outside, either hotter on a warm day or cooler on a, on a cold night. Next slide, please. And everything we do produces water. So everything here, you know, there's the washing up, the clothes washing, cooking uh, and showering, even breathing out, as I said before, even breathing out is producing moisture in increasing the level of humidity inside these nicely control controlled con and contained spaces that are getting energy efficient, but not being ventilated. Next slide, please. And then suddenly here we get, we've got a damp space and we get a bit of mold and it goes from this next slide, potentially to this. And that's the last place we want to be. This is getting really, really unhealthy because the mold's producing spores and they give off the spores, just like the spores, you know, having in, in if you ever grown mushrooms, you know, you just get a packet with almost nothing in it. And it's just the spores are so tiny, but the mold and all the fungi produce spores in this way. 
and we're very susceptible to that and it can make you know, sort of allergic reactions and actually get a whole lot worse than this. We've had you know, people who've come to us for, for systems to, to, to overcome this um, and the, the, the children can be very, very sick with, this, uh, with the results of this. Next slide, please. So it's a balancing act. Um, we need the fresh air to, so that we have a healthy lifestyle. We know we've got fresh air to run and we need the stale air to, to the stale and the humid air to be expelled. We need that changeover. So next slide, please. And uh, yes, the code requires you to have windows to open. And that's the extent to which it goes. So the bottom, li the bottom line, you, you, if you don't have windows that are open, you're illegal. If you have windows that open, that's just fine. But it's very much down to the occupant, unfortunately. Um, and we just don't live like that anymore. You know, I mean, people, when I, uh, I've been in Australia over 20 years now, but, you know, lots of older people used to say, oh, mum used to, she'd open the curtains at this time of day and close the windows, open the windows when the conditions were right. And dad would sleep in the hall because you could open the back door, the front door and all this, you know, just that's how people live. But look, I'm sorry, mum hasn't been home since the 60s. <laughs> this doesn't happen anymore. Um, and, you know, but people, they don't, their security's become an issue, so they don't want to leave with the windows open. I uh, certainly don't want to leave the house with the windows open. Um, outside, there's, I mean, we live on a, a road with lots and lots of noise, traffic noise, and really, really dusty. So, you know, we don't want those sorts of, that pollution coming in. So we live with the windows shut pretty much all the time. Um, and it's just not a, a good place. Uh, actually, our house is pretty leaky, so it, you know it's not so bad. But um, you know, it's not a condition that we'd like to be in. Next slide, please. And uh, the thing that the code says is you must have open windows to let the fresh air in and and flush air out. But the requirement generally is that if you've got an enclosed toilet and you don't have a window or laundry, and certainly over the cooking, you need to put in an extract uh, ventilation system. So there is a, an acceptance that there's, there's contamination um, from what we do in the house, and that contamination should be removed from a health point of view. The problem with it is that it doesn't actually say you then need to provide a route for the air to come in. So what happens is that when you turn your kitchen range hood on, um, it, it sucks like mad. And the tighter you make the house, the, work, the harder it has to work. But, you know, you can't create vacuums with those sorts of fans. So it just works less and less the, the tighter you make the building. Or potentially it sucks air in from other places where you're supposed to be taking air out. And uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, uh, it, it, it ends up drawing air through the downlights from the loft or worst case even than that is it draws it up through the timber floor of your you know your your heritage house and and you're getting air fresh air to breathe is actually being brought in through the fabric of the building and you know if you if you open your walls up or go up in the loft this is not a place where you want to put your nose and start breathing in so you know that that, that concept of just drawing air in by extraction only is is really is, is not a good place to be next slide please now uh, a lot of you will probably have uh trickle vents this is a, a typical uh, element to to relieve uh this uh this vacuum situation when you run extraction um, in, in modern commercial windows that you'll find in apartments uh, is that you'll have trickle vents. And these are, these are good, so long as you have them open, um, but they work particularly in relieving the, fresh, the, the requirement for uh, uh, when the, the extract air is, is running. So you're taking air out of the building, you're allowing that air to come back in. So that's doing with that. And actually you can, you can, you know, that works relatively well on changing the air over. It only, only works to any effect when you've got the extract running. But the real problem with this is that it actually only brings in air that's out from outside so there may be some filters in it and there's some noise attenuation so that shouldn't be so bad but the temperature of the air that's coming in is whatever it is that happens to be outside so you know if it's if it's five degrees or zero degrees outside or if it's 35 or 40 degrees outside that's the temperature of the air that you're going to be bringing in in that point so really good idea as long as you use them but you need to combine that with uh, with extraction now um I had a word with our with our suppliers, and um, uh, this is not to say anything about well recommendation, but it is possible to make that that extraction work uh, on a much more a much more effective way 
if you uh, allow that trickle ventilation work with the fresh air and the changeover to get rid of the toxins and the humidity, if you run the extract fans. But most of these are designed to run at a very high speed and run for a short period of time. That's what they do. Um, the requirement is that they do that for a, certain, for a certain period. Sometimes they might be wired through the light. So if you turn the light on, they run. And then you notice when you turn the light off, they just go off. Um, so they don't run for very long and, and it's not normally sufficient to be able to deal with um, with toilet fumes even, never mind with, the, with the, the, the moisture from a shower or a bath or even maybe even in your enclosed laundry space. So they need to run for a longer period. Sometimes they'll have an overrun timer on them, could be 15 minutes, something like that, and that's better than nothing. But it would be really nice if you could actually combine one of these sorts of fans uh, with the trickle vents and that would be a, a process that would continue to vent um, uh, and continue to dry out that moisture that you're getting in, in, in the house and uh, run at a low enough speed would be the advantage um, and this one um, you can run it down at quite a low speed um, and I know that there are others in design we know that the large uh, fan supplier that we deal with um, they're actually working on development of a fan that we can utilize in conjunction with trickle vents. You still get the cold air coming in, but it's going to be running at a much slower speed so that, you know, it's less, less imposing in terms of the energy for reheating and recooling the needs to keep the comfort levels up. Next slide, please. So would Roger, you need to put one of those in every room. Is that the idea? No, what you would, you basically, um, you, I'm talking from a passive house point of view now, the, the requirement is that you extract from all the areas that get the, the most contamination. So toilets, bathrooms, uh, laundries, any, any wet areas like that. Sometimes you we'll do walk-in robes and things like that because, you know, mm -hmm. you smelly around the shoes for some people um, and, uh, and, and the kitchen. So all those areas we would extract from um, because that's the contaminated area. But at the same time, in a passive house, you're providing fresh air to all the living rooms. So the bedrooms, study, living, dining, all of those, those habitable rooms get fresh air supplied to them. And they're, they're, the two flows are, are balanced out. So the air is constantly moving slowly through the house or through your apartment from living spaces to the contaminated area. So you never allow that contamination to move back through the house, it's always going in that single direction. And this could certainly uh, work in that way with your. Um, with your trickle vents, because trickle vents are probably going to be in the bigger windows in the bedroom and the and the and the living area. And with a fan like this that runs on a fairly constant basis, um, uh, but at a very low speed, uh, the, uh, the 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 air is always going to be flowing from the the, the living spaces, the, the other where the trickle vents are, through to the extraction points where the humidity is. Next slide. So no, you wouldn't need one in every room. You would, you, it would be good to have them where you at, wherever you have an extract point. But I think probably as an interim, you know, it would be when these things are become available, good to actually uh, may put them, choose the worst place, probably where you mostly where you shower or bath, because that's the areas that maybe going to get the uh, the greatest amount of moisture into it. So. Um, we have uh, the, the in, in Passive House, the development has gone to a point where you do this extract and supply, but the trick is um, the, the, uh, in the systems that they supply is the optimum word is ventilation. The systems ventilate the houses and that's what we're missing in our code at the moment is a requirement for some form of managed and controlled ventilation. It's just openable windows uh, when, the, when the occupant feel they can do it. So this this optimum word is again is ventilation. Next slide, please. So how do we guarantee this? Well, um, we can keep the, in the air temperature the right level. We can keep humidity to some level, but we can't guarantee that fresh air and we can't guarantee that we're constantly moving that air through. The, the, uh, in, in passive house, um, and this is this is not something that's new. This is the first run was built in the in the nineties, and now all even social housing in Germany now is required to be built to this level. And much of Europe is actually going to the point where you know lots of places in the UK, uh, Ireland, you have to build in in Dublin, you have to build everything to this standard. Um, it's a it's a 
a comfort and health standard, which produces when you build to produce those things, you actually get really good benefits in terms of energy use. Um, and the mechanical systems that they put in, and we're thinking that this is going to be a massive thing, but it's not much different to your air conditioning system, but it would be set to run a very, very low, but constant air change. And it would take about a third of the air in your apartment and throw it away uh, every hour and bring in exactly the same amount of air. So without any drafts, because it's run very, very slowly, just enough to, talk, to deal with your, with your breathing requirements um, and to take out the necessary moisture, about a third of an air change per hour. Um, we use recirculating hoods, um, replaces all the toilet ven ventilation, and it does all that extracting at the same time. And they use about 36 watts. So that's, you know, that's, that's a, an old, pretty dim light bulb was what it costs to run one of these units. The, um, the real trick in here, and I think this is the next slide, is the fact that it has heat recovery in it. So the, the, the air, as you can see here, you've got a supply bone where your trickle vents would be. Uh, in the living areas in your bedrooms and then the air comes in at these areas passes through and is extracted out in all the wet areas and uh, yeah you can still open the windows with these two next slide so this is this is this is the trick with uh, with this system this is the real uh, uh, killer in terms of the the, uh, the 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 crunching the problem um and it's a heat exchanger so within the unit the, uh, the, the extract air is brought from all the places where you've got the moisture, but the places you've warmed up, you know, like the bathroom. Uh, I've never quite understand the star rating system, which says, oh, we don't heat bathrooms. We've just lost Roger. <laughs> um. So I guess I can kind of continue on since I'm um, talking until Roger maybe rejoins us. So I guess from what he's saying here is that you take the heat, the heat or the wet areas and what it basically does is then cool it. So when it actually comes back out, you've not got that moisture content um, with the actual um, uh, kind of like hair, air exchange that's going on. And of course, that's what's actually causing problems. Um, for me, I also want to talk about the fact that sometimes um, you'll be told by the builder that um, you're a south facing, for example, Melbourne apartment. And so the moisture that you're seeing is actually condensation. But in fact, sometimes that moisture you're seeing can actually be water penetration from outside. Right. And so um, I had that exact uh, situation recently with a client of mine, Lee Litz, and um, she had a, a south facing Melbourne apartment, but when I sent in built assess to have a look at the water membrane protection that was put into place, um, it was patchy, it was actually bubbling. And in fact, um, the ceiling above um, Lee's apartment, which acted as a balcony for the penthouse above her, had no drainage on it whatsoever. And so I rang the developer and I said to him, there's no drainage on the um, ceiling or the roof um, upstairs. And his response to me was, um, the building code says I don't need to have drainage on the roof. And I said to him, really, is that how we're going to proceed here? So um, at, the, at the same time, while you may actually have this buildup of moisture within your apartment as a result of the heating, such as the showers, the you know, the laundry and the kitchen. Um, at the same time, you could be impacted from water penetration from outside. So through your windows, through your doors, especially if your balcony does not step down from your um, living space, what you tend to find is if the um, water is actually not having a chance to run away um, from the apartment, it will actually flood back into the apartment. And so those kinds of things can also cause mold. So it's not just about hot air being trapped within your apartment, there can be a number of other issues that also occur. Um, so Roger's dropped off and he's not sitting back into the uh, waiting room. So I'm gonna continue on. Oh, hold on, here we go. Um, no, that's not going to be um, Roger. All right. So um, as he says, um, a balanced system airflow rate. So fresh air and extracting stale human air eliminates the um, 
fear of contaminants being drawn into your home. Um, and it's about a balanced system, as you were saying, in terms of um, fresh air coming in and, um, you know, the toxic air actually um, being extracted. Um, and he's talking about this exchanger, which is a passive house exchanger. Um, and up to 96% of the temperature difference is transferred in the exchanger, which, um, you know, it certainly is um, what we're looking for, right? Especially since you don't necessarily want to be opening up your windows in the middle of winter and having rain come in as well. The idea is if we can put something in place that will actually allow us to extract, uh, that would be even better. Um, so he's talking here about the fact that the fan um, involved in this extractor is a very low noise, which is great. Um, and, you know, um, it's, um, it's important that, um, you know, here he comes. Phew, hey, eh? two slides in, I'm still carrying on. Not bad, hey? Um, so, Roger, nice of you to join us again, darling. I've been kind of like moving on with the slideshow, so I hope that's okay with you. So, as he was saying, so the noise, obviously, it's important that if you have these extractor fans in your um, home, that you're not actually hearing them whirring, um, because then what you want to do is obviously then um, turn them off. So, are you there, Roger? I am, yes. My apologies for that. Um, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I can't have moved on, darling. I hope that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. The um the um uh, the, the internet died on me, so I'm I'm back on now. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, good. So um, I was just talking with this side about the noise. I'm assuming that I'm right, saying that the fans are a very low noise in terms of then the extraction that they're they're undertaking. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and and the the there are two things about noise. There can be breakout noise from the fan unit itself, um, and dependent on the on the quality of the of the appliance, then yeah, some are going to be less quiet than others. Um, the other thing is about airflow. Um, air, air flows, you know, in, a, in your ducted system, you can often often get quite a bit of noise out them because of the air flowing is flowing very very fast, and that creates noise in the in the crinkliness of the duct. So. In, uh, in slow moving air in the HRV systems, the, uh, it's, it's very limited in terms of the amount of air, um, but also the, uh, the speed of the air is quite low. Um, so you don't get the noise and there's a smooth inside, so you don't get resistance in it either. So um, yeah, I, it is a very, uh, it's an obvious system, uh, um, obvious fault in the system uh, when they haven't been designed and uh, uh, adequate uh, capacity uh, um, for the airflow that you need. Um, different sorts of systems, basic, very basically. Um, you can have uh, centralized systems, so they will deal, they will collect air in um, and, and take it out to a single unit, and then you have bits of ducting that run off to uh, to each of the supply area rooms and the and the extract area rooms. You can see a little layout here that's um, uh, uh, showing the uh, uh, the arrangement of the ducting that would run in the false ceiling and the seating space. Next slide. So we're looking at the picture on the left-hand side, Roger. I'm assuming that little wee white box. That's the yes, it is. There are, uh, there are lots. Yeah, there, um, and there are lots of different sorts. There are ones that you can put up in the seating that, that, that sit flat up on, on the top. Um, tall, thinner ones that sit in the laundry cupboard. Um, it really does depend on the size of the, of the unit, uh, of the apartment or the house that you're dealing with. Um, they range from really quite big boxes, at, you know, almost dishwasher size. Um, but down to little tiny things like this. We're putting, we got, we've just done a little cottage and we're putting a, a 120 in that. And it's a, it's a, well, maybe less than 900 high by half a meter wide um, and less the thickness of a bookshelf. So, you know, they, they have to be very big if, uh, when, but, but they are sized to suit the capacity of the space you're dealing with. Mm, that's great. And, and then there's decentralized systems um, that, that you can get benefit by changing the air right down at the bottom end of these. It's just uh, tends to be how effective they are at filtering and how effective they are at, uh, at heat recovery. So, um, you know, you could have an extract fan in, in any of the rooms in your, in your apartment or in your house and take air in. It's good to have um, uh, fresh air being allowed in, just like the trickle vents in your windows and the extracts in the, in the, in the toilets and the bathrooms. Um, but there are, uh, there are systems that are available where they are, they just work on their own like these two, 
um, they supply and extract at the same at the same time and have a heat recovery system in them. Or there are the units that you could run in pairs that to sit through through a wall. They're probably about uh, close to 300 millimeters long. That tube in the wall. So on some walls you may have to pack them out a bit with a, with some uh, some framing and a little bit of flashing. But um, uh, they work in pairs and one sucks and one and the other one blows. So they they run for 70 seconds um, or thereabouts and they have a ceramic core in them. So as they're sucking air out, they're taking on the energy, whether it be cool or, or heat um, from the extract air. Um, and then after 70 seconds, when they warmed up in the winter or cooled down in the summer, um, the two reverse. So one sucks and one blows and they reverse every 70 seconds. Um, and then uh, that, uh, that, that changes the air over and will eventually um, just balance out the humidity levels and certainly the fresh air levels. So what all these systems are doing is diluting the amount of toxins by bringing in fresh air and extracting from the worst areas. And the uh, the little through the wall ones do exactly the same thing, um, but uh, you know they're they're a lot more economical. Um, but by the time you've put a, a house worth of them in, you might want four, maybe even five pairs of them. By the time you've got to that level of expense, you'd be looking at the same cost for a centralized system. So you know it, it balances out. If it's just a very small operation, then yeah, the smaller ones would work. Um, the the again, they're very much dependent on the um, the quality of the of the capacity and the sizing, and also the uh, the quality of the fans and the units themselves. Next, and time. these would need to interface with an external wall, right? So the yeah. whole idea is that they actually have some suck in from the fresh air from outside. That's exactly right, and I and I have to say that that we've looked at for a number of people at uh, uh, at, at apartments. Um, we I have to say we've not found a really effective way where people could get either strata approval to do works on the outside um, or even pulled some of the, the full ceilings apart, you know, to put ducting in. So it's proving difficult um, in terms of retrofit at the moment to do these sorts of systems. Um, I think uh, that the, the, as an interim uh, on existing buildings, maybe uh, the thing that's in development, which is a very slow running fan, which you can use to replace your, uh, the normal extract fans that you've mm. got in, in, in the system that mm. can run all the time in association with trickle vents, um, mm. that can prove, I think, to be uh, a solution, not in terms of keeping them um, as, as, as comfortable in terms of, you know, the, the, the incoming fresh air being um, not being uh, run through a heat exchanger, so you haven't got the, the benefits of that, but it is going to resolve the... Uh, uh, the humidity and the fresh, the, the, the toxicity of the air in apartments. Mm -hmm. Next slide. My apartment at Design actually has like a front door that actually um, faces out to a, an unexposed kind of wall area. So it's a walkway, basically, that yeah. accesses our apartments. So yeah. we could definitely fit one that would actually be at the front door, so to speak, and interface oh. with the, um, the fresh air coming that way yeah. versus out through the balcony. Yeah, that's right. So, and you want to know about the cost. So this is very, very rough. It does depend entirely on the, the arrangement, the layout. Um, and this is only for the cost of equipment. But look, for a small apartment, we're talking maybe five to $8,000 for the equipment. Um, and running up when, you know, you get to big housing, it can, you know, we might have five or six bathrooms and, and wet areas and, uh, uh, and kitchen and then uh, uh, maybe, seven eight supply room so we could be into maybe or tw maybe fifteen twenty thousand dollars for the equipment when you start to get into big systems the real key here is the fact that the running costs are really really low um, and you get a, a massive improvement in quality of the environment so you, you're definitely not going to get any mold and, con and condensation is going to be absolutely limited what what actually happens here is that the systems run uh, at an economical level, a sensible level. So you're not having to heat up the, the air that's coming in or cool it down particularly. That they run with the heat, the, we have units that run and they drop maybe half a degree or one degree. Uh, on a really hot day, you might be dropping one and a half degrees, something like that. So the, the amount of uh, additional energy you have to put in to keep the temperature right inside the house is really minimal. 
and, uh, and it cuts that down massively. Once you get to be, the house gets, the building apartments get airtight as they are anyway, um, the, the cost of running the equipment to keep a healthy space is really, really low. And I think the operative word here is healthy, right? Um, because at the end of the day, we, you know, I've had, I've had um, people call me up and they actually, the husband was getting extremely sick all the time. Yep. And they decide to remove the bed head, which was yep. placed against the wall. And yep. when they moved the bed head, it was completely covered in mould. And no wonder yep. he was getting sick, you know. That's right. Um, well, look, we've had one uh, just recently, um, a lady came to us um, and, uh, and uh, she they, they were keeping the house closed. They lived in the house for six or seven years. The daughter had always been sick. They'd moved out for six months following a. Uh, an unfortunate flood, um, which really didn't have anything to do with the, the previous conditions. Um, and the daughter got well. After six years of living in the house, she moved out to another house and then she got well. And uh, when we went to see her, to, I mean, she could well have done with a heat recovery ventilation system in her house, but um, again, it was we're going to be difficult to, to retrofit. Um, but uh, but it's, it appeared she'd been using, a, they'd been living with a, uh, a non-vented gas fire which they ran constantly in the winter. And she, as she said, she smashed the laundry and there was no ex, no mechanical extract in the laundry. Mm -hmm. um, toilet vents wasn't even, the, the fan wasn't connected to the box and the ducting from the box wasn't connected to that either. So just discharging air from the toilet into the into the full ceiling space in the house. Um, and, and she was getting condensation on the windows and mold on the windows. Um, because of the the a massive amount of oh she ran a tumble dryer yeah she ran a tumble laundry and with no exhaust out to the outside so it just dumped masses of moisture into the air in, in the air in the laundry um, there was no extract from that particular room the uh, and and she dried she was obviously like we did lots, lots and lots of washing um, and dried the laundry in the dining area now the house obviously was getting very very wet and the fumes from the heater were obviously getting very toxic. And they weren't ventilating. So uh, this clearly, um, you know, there was a, a occupant behaviour, if you like, uh, nothing wrong, just not being aware. Um, yeah. And uh, they they decided that they would do away with the heat. They realised that the heater was causing massive problems for them, dumping lots more moisture from the gas that was being burnt into the house. So yeah. conundrum of moisture that you're not getting rid of and you're not letting balance out with the outdoor air. Mm. Um, toxicity that's just not being done by ventilation and fortunately with so many things in the in the construction engine the building code is set at absolute minimum levels um and the what it, it's saying at the moment is you will have openable windows that can be operated by the occupant and unfortunately our lifestyles change so much now and the conditions i mean no one wants to open the windows on the 14th floor do they, they get sucked out <laughs> Well, and you know, it's it's a kind of like you know a difficult thing. You've got the heater on because it's cold, but then you're opening the window, like it's kind of like an oxymoron, right? Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. it is, and that's this conundrum. Uh, I look, I think there's, I noticed uh, well, two things that have just come out. Run, there's a, a big grant's been given at the moment for, for some study. Just recently, in the last few days, I've seen it uh, publicised that this is going to go to um, uh, the university in Tasmania. Um, the HIA are involved in this, I think, uh, the CSIRO and the people that, you know, we, we deal in, in high performance building membranes uh, for air tightness and weatherproofing. Um, and they're involved and the, they do a thing called Woofy, which talks about um, it's an analysis tool for talking about moisture transmission through building structures. Suddenly there's an awareness that this this is really going to is becoming important and people mm -hmm. are you know it's going to have to be taken account of because it is part of this conundrum you can't just say uh seal it up and uh and it'll be fine um i mean stay warm because the realization now is that there's a whole lot it's a whole lot bigger picture that and so many more things in the ramifications from this have all got to be brought in and understood before they can finally um uh, get round to sorting the, the, the code out and and get these questions right for us correct
And, you know, the idea that you will run humidifiers and um, keep the fans on for longer than you're cooking or showering or whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. like you're saying, you know, if you, even if you run them for an extra half an hour post that, it actually yeah. is a constant requirement, right, to exchange that air that's going to make the difference. Yeah, and I think I think that the 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 we we do find with the systems that they won't necessarily dry the shower in fifteen minutes, and that, and that doesn't you know I'm sure you can run the fan in your in your bathroom for fifteen minutes and go back in there and it won't be dry; it'll still be yeah. wet. If the fan goes off, that humidity it's going to dry out, but it dries out and moves back into the apartment and gets absorbed by everything that's in the apartment. So run running the fans at a slower speed for a longer period maybe mm -hmm. all day and that's i think where we certainly where the where the, the hrv systems run is they run constantly to keep it fresh and to keep the moisture content uh, down and yeah they, they run really dry and really really fresh and it's um, yeah but it's 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 a big step to go at this point but it's the it is the answer we know this we've been running it in the in in europe for oh, 20 years now so yeah mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go to the questions, Roger, if I can. So, Melissa, yeah, has, sure. what's the best thing for older apartments? I'm in a 1970s double brick and it's bad during winter. <laughs> yes, uh, it's, a, it's a real hard one. Look, uh, at the end of the day, the ventilation is, is the only way. And this is what the, the lady in, in Auckland found, that um, you, you've got to ventilate to get the moisture down and keep the, the, the fresh air up. Um, and uh, and the only way that they could get that working, uh, and this was New Zealand, of course, so it's, it's a whole lot worse case than, than most, most of Australia, um, uh, was actually running a heater at the same time. So this is not an effective way to be. Um, there, I think the, uh, the, the, the there has to be an air exchange to make the place healthy. Um, you know, there's, uh, the, the Salvation Army have always said you need to sleep with the wind, though you sleep better. They, I think they've got the, they've got that absolutely right. Um, we need proper ventilation. And is there a right answer? Uh, you could you could certainly look at uh, uh, at the smaller uh, individual ones if it's a if it's a relatively small apartment. Um, the decentralised ones and they are available. Um, number of people have got them, and uh, they need they need some coring, and so they need holes to be drilled through the wall to put them in. But they're relatively simple to do, and uh, the power connection. Um, you, they run in synchronization with, with each other, one in the bedroom, one in the living area. And that's giving you a constant uh, air exchange with, with a, uh, a reasonable amount of heat recovery in the cores uh, as they, uh, they recycle on and off. Right. What if you only have an exhaust point? Um, well, look, I think if, if you've only got exhaust points um, in your, obviously the bathrooms and things, yeah, these, the, uh, the slow running fans will come available. I know they're in development. Um, and I think that will be a relatively simple exchange um, for the fans that you've already got. The, the ducting is already there to do that. Uh, it's not the best in terms of, of, of energy efficiency, but just running very slowly, um, they'll give you the, the, the humidity reduction and the fresh air the, 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 to reduce the contamination. So better health, um, but unfortunately, a little, more, a little more cost in terms of keeping the temperature right. But I guess if you're going to be living in that house or that apartment, you know, 365 days a year for how many years? You know, I guess if you think about the cost and you break it down the daily rate, it's, you know, kind of negligible considering your health, right? Uh, well, this is the real... Um, uh, we don't put... And this has been the argument in terms of pushing the better standard is that it's very hard to get people to say, what's my health worth? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's a bit like, you know, oh, what's, the, what's the quality of my retirement like? You know, do I want this level or do I want, do I want something better than that? So, you know, it's, a, it's something we really should, you know, maybe put a, a take a, a stand back and have a, a view on it and, and just uh, take a balance, a bit more perspective and say, what's the, the, the quality of life? How important is that to me? Um, and uh, yeah, when you get into one of these really good ones, then massive, massive uh, be uh, benefits. Um, the freshness in, a, in, in high performance housing is just amazing, the difference. Mm. Tell you people, so, it's like getting out of the car when you get to the beach, you know, you go, what <laughs> <laughs> is that? So a question, um, how much is a Panasonic exhaust ventilation unit place and how much for installation? I guess that's kind of like a, how long is a piece of string, right? Yeah, look, I, I, I just flicked the question across to our supplier yeah. Um, 
he said they've got something in development, which is a relatively simple thing. But the only thing that he could point me out of that, and this was yesterday, um, and and that was that's the unit. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, it would be uh, very much the case of your your electrician uh, giving you a price for a supply and install. Yep, great. Do you filter? Do you change the filters? I, I have to say I, I don't know that there are any filters. Well, there wouldn't. There probably are not filters in there. Uh, simply because it's only extracting in a yeah. in a um, yeah in a in a in a uh, heat recovery ventilation system there are filters um, they're they're designed to filter the air that's coming in and there are different grades of filters uh, you know they're they G4s and F7s is what's required for um, for passive house um, there are options to put extra filter boxes in and put HEPA filters in um, that came out after the uh, the Victorian bushfires where people were obviously wanting to, to continue to, to run their systems um, for fresh air, but the, uh, the smoke was just too much and, uh, and the normal filters will take a lot of things out, but they don't take out um, viruses and smoke. So that's where the HEPA filters have, have started to come in now. So, um, and look, if you've got, if you've got neighbors who are keen on barbecuing and you want to run fresh air in, then yeah, the HEPA filters will deal with that too. Mm. So how effective are portable air filters such as IQ air filters as a solution for older apartments? Oh, look, they're filtering out particulate matter. They're not filtering out CO2 and they're not filtering out VOCs. You, the only way to get those out is to actually bring in fresh air and dilute the, the, the toxicity. So you, you've got to extract air and change it over from outside. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's equipment out there which will scrub gases out of uh, out of air, but um, you know it's not something that's normally used. But the filters that we have take out particles, um, and uh, but the, the the CO2 is not changed in those situations. Yeah, good point. Um, do humidifiers help? And if so, which ones? I guess it's the same uh, thing, isn't it? It's just circulating the air around rather than actually you know, yeah, it, it, the, the dehumidifier is is taking uh, taking the moisture out of the air, so it's reducing the humidity, the amount of uh, water vapor that's in the air. Um, uh, yeah, look, they're good. Um, and there was there's, there's, uh, I, we 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 had one unit that we installed. Well, we we supplied to a, to a lady where the little boy was very very sick, um, and they had a humidity issue. Um, but they were, had a little uh, 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 a water feeder, if you like, like, like a bird, um, bird cage feeder for, for where they have a little water thing. This was for a cat and cats apparently will only drink from moving water. So this thing's like a little fountain sitting on the on the bench top. And, and then she, she said, it's very humid in here. I said, well, you know, this, this little thing, could you put it outside? You know? because, uh, inadvertently adding to the problem with some of the things. <laughs> So yeah, um, the, the, the dehumidifiers definitely do work. Standalone ones are fine. Um, uh, even, even when we're putting in big systems, it's very hard to incorporate them in. Um, and they're actually better if you just run the system and dry the air out in the units, uh, in, the, in the apartment or the house. Um, and then the system itself will take care of the of balancing out the rest of it. But so yeah, um, dehumidifying, but it's only dealing with moisture again. It's not dealing with the of the air in terms of CO2 and the uh, uh, and the VOCs. Mm. All right, so a question from Greg. Can you get a fan that has reversible function switching between intake and exhaust? Well, the little ones that I'm talking about, they do exactly that. And they, uh, they, they you run them in pairs uh, so that you're not dragging air through the through gaps and bits of the building where you don't want to put your nose and sniff. So um, uh, they run in pairs, one sucks and one blows at the same time, and they run for about 70 seconds. Uh, the time they, they, they measure that it takes for the temperature to stabilise in the, in the ceramic core that the air passes through. Um, so let's say on a, on a, on a, uh, you've got a, a nice warm house um, or apartment in the, in, in the winter and you've got cold air coming in. So the, the air that's going out warms up the core in, in one of the units. Um, the other one's bringing air in, and after 70 seconds, when that core has, has warmed up with the outgoing air, the both fans reverse. So it now brings in air through the, the core that's warmed up, and it transfers that heat into the air, a cold air that's coming in. So that's how they, they work on, a, a, on a, uh, that cycling process. Um, 
rather than the passage of air through a heat exchanger um, where the, the, the air is running through small chambers, small channels, and transfer the, and the energy, the heat energy or cool energy transfers from one side of, of the, the membrane to the other side between the hot air and the cold air. And basically on a hot day, the, air will, the hot air will come in and the air that's cooled that you've cooled in the house with your air conditioner uh, attracts the heat. So the heat always runs from hot to cold. So the, the heat transfers through the membrane into the outgoing air, which is cold. And by the time it goes out, it's within a few degrees of the air that's outside. So you get hot air in and hot air out. And, and in the summer, you've got cold air going out and cold air coming in. And it's just a matter of transferring the heat from one airflow to the other airflow without any cross-contamination of the actual air or anything that's in it. Now, last question from what I can see. Have you got any tips on how to remove mold? Now, it kind of like alarms me. I think we talked about this, how I saw advertised on TV the other day, a carpet cleaner company that was yeah. saying they could come and remove the mold to a steam yeah. clean process. But of course, invariably, if you don't improve the um, flow of air within the apartment or you know the level of uh, moisture or humidity, of course, yeah. that mold is going to grow back, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's the conditions you're creating the conditions for mold to grow. The spores are in the air everywhere. Um, you know, I'm from the UK, and we, we used to stress about dry rot. Uh, it can be terrible and, and really. Uh, actually you know eat up the floorboards and all the joists underneath the bath where the leak is and and, and really devastate housing much like the termites can do here um mm. and you get panicked because uh, you realize that these spores are everywhere they're all over the place and just obviously in different concentrations but but when when they they only germinate when the conditions are right for them so mm. it's a matter of saying i'm not going to let these conditions exist where i live mm -hmm. The matter of unfortunately this time it's about venting and uh, you if you vent out the high humidity air and replace it with air that's from outside the air that's outside it generally um uh, got less moisture in it than we have inside so we go back all those points all those things that we do in the house in this enclosed space are actually making the conditions much much worse inside so by opening a window i mean if you've got cross you can do cross ventilation um you know across the corners or and if you can i mean like you know you said you can open the front door and you can open on the, on the balcony and get some vent right, right the way through mm. that's a massive way of actually reducing the amount of moisture that you've got in the building because it you know we, we are we're putting it in there all of the time and and balancing it down to the same conditions as outside is definitely the way to to improve that situation and the mold will go away if you ventilate enough the mold will go away mm. But as we said, you have an alternative, which is fabulous, because I think, you know, some people are going to find it difficult to actually, um, you know, open up the house in the middle of winter. Um, yes. And what they're looking for is something that's of a more permanent kind of fixture sure. um, and kind of doesn't require them to be thinking about it, you know. Yes. And I think that's important, right? Well, I'll, I'll certainly be shoving along our supplier and their developers, and, and I'll let you know when this, when this unit comes on board. <laughs> With a little, a, a little help from you, we can probably speed things up. <laughs> well i really appreciate your time today roger it's been very informative and i think um it's shed some light on why there is mold and how we can actually deal with it um on a permanent basis or even temporary with uh, opening up our uh, windows and doors yeah. um just quick sorry oh yeah just short yeah that's that's it, it it's rudimentary unfortunately that's where the code is at the present time yeah. um and 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 it's very very the whole building process is very very price sensitive, um, and and there there needs to be an acceptance or, or there needs to be a demand from people to say I want something a bit better. You know I don't want solid tires on my Ferrari. Yeah. I want some nice low profile you know slicks on my on my Ferrari that are going to go with that. And that's the the balance out of the quality that you that people are looking for, and it's down to health. The quality yeah. of the quality of the of what you're prepared to pay for will give you a, be a better health outcome. Correct, correct. Um, just quickly before we finish up today, um, so we have a number of events coming up on the 30th of November. We're talking about the Vic maintenance, Victorian maintenance plans, which are coming into effect with the Victorian uh, changes to the Strata Act. Um, and in January, for our WA counterparts. We actually have a SAT, which is State Administrative Tribunal 101, 
that's equivalent to a VCAT or a QCAT um, in terms of when you're about to take it to the court situation because you've had enough. Um, and that's about how you can be prepared for um, taking it to court. 8th of February, we're talking about navigating defects in strata. Hazel Eastthorpe from University of New South Wales is doing a session about that. Uh, she's just finished some research in that area. So we're very happy to actually invite her on our channel to have a chat. And then in March, we're doing a session on about strata improvement loans, the what, how and why, um, in terms of when do you need to bring them on board? And especially when we're talking about defects or improvements to your strata company or your actual uh, development. So as always, um, we are contactable um, on website or on email. I just want to acknowledge our sponsors. We're very grateful to uh, the way that they financially assist us to do these kinds of sessions, um, as well as also a number of other things such as our Queensland and New South Wales education kit. Um, so please um, reach out to us. Let me know if there's anything else that you would like to be enrolled with in terms of the events that are coming up. And once again, I appreciate your time um, coming in and tuning in for this session. And once again, thank you, Roger, for also taking us through that discussion. I found it very informative. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. And we'll be back in touch. Speak soon. See ya.